Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, the Digital KCC seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Amit Seldes, who is a researcher at the uh, Institute for Deutsche Sprache at the Umbos, uh, Umbos University, and is presenting today um, about tools digital Coptic, searching and visualizing Coptic manuscript data. So I will hand it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me here. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about Coptic, which is a language that, as the, the abstract of this talk said, has been chronically underrepresented in the digital humanities. So I hope I'll be able to show you some first steps in, in dealing with this language. But at the same time, I'll try to make my statements or, or my uh, narrative relevant for other disciplines. And I think anybody working on manuscript data will find something that's relevant in this talk. Um, the basic plan is to introduce Coptic and Coptic data, because maybe not everybody is familiar with the language and its data. And then I'll talk rather briefly about annotations that we've done on the data so far. This is partly because I gave a talk about a similar topic about annotation in Leipzig last month. I might go back to that and give a brief recap of that. But then come the two main parts of the talk, firstly about searching through Coptic data, and that has to do with architectures, representing the data, um, specifically about multiple segmentations or ways of splitting up the data into different um, uh, basic units, and uh, the software that we, do to, we use to do so, which is Anis. And then I'll talk a little bit about corpus formats and um, how we convert between formats, deal with the different data models of TEI and, and other ways of linguistic uh, data representation. And in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about visualizations and mainly make a distinction between dedicated visualizations, where you make everything just so for a specific kind of data and probably never use them again, versus reusable and generic visualizations, which are uh, potentially much more useful because they can apply to very many types of data, but at the same time, they're less specialized, so they have some disadvantages as well. Okay, um, so I'll start by saying a little bit about um, us, us being um, my collaborator, Professor Caroline T. Schroeder, and myself. Um, Caroline Schroeder is Professor of Religious and Classical Studies at the University of the Pacific and the Director of the Humanities Center there. Um, I am a linguist by training, so I have a very different background. So it's actually a, an interesting story how we met and how we started cooperating. Um, we started cooperating when we met um, at an NEH Summer Institute in Medford in 2012 uh, on the topic of text in a digital age. And um, pretty soon we realized that a lot of the, the challenges that um, Carrie was seeing in Coptic data were things that there could be answers to using corpus linguistics techniques that I was working on, but um, these were things that had not been applied to Coptic yet and needed some sort of an adaptation. And this led to a cooperation that we call Coptic Scriptorium, um, which has produced some open source resources that you can have online. So if you, you're interested in the resources, please have a look at the website cited here. I imagine these slides will be put online at the end of the talk, or otherwise I'll put them on my site. And um, basically, we've produced some tools for annotating Coptic, things like part of speech tagging, normalizing, um, segmenting um, Coptic data. And uh, we've produced some corpora that you can just have and download and do whatever you want with. Um, so why Coptic? Why do we find this language interesting? Well, to give a little bit of background to those who are maybe not familiar with the language, um, Coptic is the last stage of the ancient Egyptian language. That's the same language that was written with hieroglyphs um, in the millennia before um, the Common Era. And then in the first millennium, this language starts being written in, in Greek script, or a Greek script with some additional characters. And um, it becomes a, a unique source of evidence or of, of historical knowledge about the Mediterranean world, because it gives you a perspective that's distinctly Egyptian, not European. Um, and it's also a, a witness to some of the most important developments in, in the history of that period, because it's kind of a contact point, because you have a Hellenistic culture on the one hand, the local culture on the other hand, the rise of Christianity at the same time. Um, so it's really a very significant language for historians of that period. For linguists as well, it's a very interesting language because, um, well, first of all, for historical linguistics, it happens to be the language with the longest uh, continuous documentation of any language of the world. So together with the previous stages of uh, Egyptian language, Coptic and Egyptian together cover about four and a half millennia of human history. Um, that's a pretty am amazing time span if you're interested in what happens to languages over such really extremely long periods. Um, it's also very interesting for contact linguistics because it has been heavily influenced by Greek. Um, and this amounts to a lot more than just borrowing vocabulary. You also have borrowing of grammatical structures. Um, for instance, what do the, the Greek um, uh, par particles do in Coptic is a very interesting subject, or um, compound words that incorporate Greek and Egyptian native elements. So you get a lot of complex verbs of the type do Greek lexeme to kind of integrate the words into the Egyptian um, grammar. 
And it's a very interesting language grammatically. And finally, it has a great religious significance. So it is the language of the Coptic Church. And it was there when Christianity kind of came about and before it was a state religion. So for very early Christianity, some of the most interesting texts are available in Coptic that you will not find in other languages. Uh, particularly if you're interested in the rise of monasticism, which is very much an Egyptian phenomenon. So if you're interested in, in understanding why people started living together in the Koino beyond, why did they start worshiping God together and, and dedicating their life, lives to, to living together, this is a concept that's not at all trivial and it's a very valid question. What were the rules about living together and being monks at the beginning? So who made these up and why and how? And finally, also for um, streams of thinking that are not Christian or not canonical Christianity, there are very many interesting texts specifically about Gnosticism that are not available in any other language and um, also about other types of uh, later heresies or later uh, variants that did not make it in the sense of um, canonical Christianity. Um, as you can also see in the map on the right, there are uh, several dialects of um, Coptic, and I think it's said this in the abstract but not in the title. Our work focuses on Sahidic Coptic. That's kind of the, the language of the most yeah, classical resources, one of the, the earlier Coptic dialects. The language of the present-day Coptic church is actually the Bohiric dialect, or based on the Bohiric di dialect. Um, we are currently only working on Sahidic, but um, I suppose that's a possible direction for future expans expansion to look at the other dialects. Okay, so th those were a few words about Coptic. Now I'll come to the data. Um, I'd like to point out that Coptic has a lot of material. It's not one of those little languages where there are a few inscriptions and then you're done. Um, it's a language that has, thanks to the Egyptian desert, massive amounts of papyrus material that's been preserved which makes for very happy, happy philologists. And at the same time, perhaps surprisingly, or because of its um, particular history, there's relatively little of it online. So the amount of people who know Coptic can read Coptic is not great. Um, and you cannot compare the situation for Coptic online with that of Greek and Latin. So for Greek and Latin, if you look at something like Perseus, you're probably fairly confident that you can find whatever you need, or at least the entry level stuff. If you're interested in, in the Odyssey, I'm sure all of you, I don't know who has bothered to download the Odyssey in XML and know that they have it, but I'm sure all of you are confident that you can get it, right? Nobody here doubts that it's possible to get the Odyssey, right? That's easy. That's very much not the case for Coptic. So name an important Coptic text, you probably can't have it. You can't have it in digital format. I mean, if you're lucky, you'll find some scanned PDF of, of a book, but you might as well then get the book out of the library. And in many cases, there is no book. So for a lot of resources, we know that they exist because there are ostraca or because there are papyri that have been archived by some museum. So there's some metadata, but nobody's gone about transcribing them or translating them or publishing them in an edition. And even let's say that they did publish them in an edition, they're still not, you can't even use control F and search through them because they've never been digitized. Um, one of the things you can get is the New Testament, um, but let's even think about things that are online. It's not normalized, it's not lemmatized, it's not annotated in any way that helps you to search through it. So you can read it, but um, you can't do very much with it. And a lot of other texts, even the Old Testament, you can't just download the Old Testament in Coptic, which is perhaps an astounding fact. Um, or other important texts that are perhaps less well known, say the rule of, of Pacomius, which is the first set of instructions how monks should live in a monastery, not available in Coptic online. Um, or the work, works of Shinuda of Atripa, one of the more, most important uh, saints of the Coptic Church, also very influential in the rise of monasticism, and many other texts. A further interesting fact is that many of these texts have been actually digitized, but they're lying around on some researcher's hard drive. So they've never been published, but somebody used them for their dissertation or for whatever reason, and they're digitized in one of 10 different standards to uh, transliterate Coptic. And that's where they kind of die because they didn't make it to be published. So one of the things our project is very interested in is locating people who have this data and are interested in putting it out but do not have the computational resources to do so. So we provide some tools for that. Okay, so those were a few words about the data. Um, just to give you a sense of, of what the texts we're working with are like, I like to have a small excerpt from text so that people can get a, a feel for the, the language and, and what the texts are about. So we've worked on Chinuda's texts. Um, well, Kerry's worked a great deal on Chinuda, and, and one of his more, more interesting sermons is Abraham, Our Father. It's a sermon to be read to the monks in the monastery, and it draws analogies be between the lives of the patriarchs and people living in the monastery. So here's a little excerpt. Um, As for us, brethren, let us live by the truth so that we are upstanding in all our works, and so that the prophets, apostles, and all the saints might dwell among us. So it's kind of preaching to the community. Um, this kind of thing was read to the community. And um, you see there's a lot of direct speech to the audience. It's, it's a very direct text. At the same time, it also has narrative parts. So there are long parts that just describe the lives of the patriarchs and kind of draw these analogies to the community. 
Um, other texts look very different. So something like the Apothegma de Patrum that I've worked on a little bit, uh, The Sayings of the Desert Fathers, is a collection of short stories about um, hermits, essentially, who live in the desert. Desert Fathers because most of them are men, but here's an example about a woman. Um, they said about the Blessed Sarah the Virgin that she spent 60 years living at the top of the river, meaning the Nile, and she never set foot outside to see the river. So she spent 60 years in a cave, and this is a sign of her holiness that she was able to uh, realize the ideal of asceticism and kind of live in this cave for 60 years. And that's a typical text. There's also a lot of dialogue, a lot of, of monks talking to each other about life as hermits. And the third text that we've used for uh, our work has been the New Testament, which probably doesn't need any introductions. We've mostly worked on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, if you're interested in these corpora, like I said, you can just download them. They're in, um, under a Creative Commons license, and you can just have them. Okay, what I will not talk very much about today is getting from raw text to annotated corpora, um, because I uh, spoke about that in Leipzig last month, and the slides are on my page, so anybody more interested in that, we probably won't have time today, but maybe in the questions, I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, I'll give a very brief recap of, of what we do or what we have done. We usually start with somebody giving us a diplomatically transcribed text, or, or doing it ourselves, if it's their text that we're working on and then annotating them in some ways. And um, the first thing you need to do is normalize them. So very briefly, you just try to transform everything into a standard orthography as found in, in a dictionary. Um, this is done automatically insofar as um, we see a word form that we already know has a known variant or automatically removable diacritics that we're aware of. Um, and this is just based on a list. And the list is growing as we work, but a lot of stuff is just unexpected. And then we see, oh, this is a new abbreviation, a new uh, form of, of um, nomina sacra or something like that that we need to uh, um, add to the automatic list. So this is a picture from our search interface. You can see the diplomatic form kolikion or kolikion probably in post-classical um, pronunciation and the normalized form is kollegion marked in red. That's uh, from Latin collegium um, and that's done automatically or corrected by hand. Then you need to segment the data, and this is an important thing to say about Coptic. Coptic is a more, more or less a good example of a, a, an agglutinative language, or, or one that it's well, well on its way to becoming a full agglutinative, agglutinative language. Um, and it has complex word forms, and there are different conventions on what constitutes a word form. We more or less follow uh, Leighton's grammar, which is an influ influential grammar. Um, so you have things like Jintai Romonachos, since I became a monk. And this is kind of a, a conglomerate of morphemes, meaning since and that, and a past marker, and a first person singular marker, and, marker, and then some sort of complex verb, do monk. Um, and the reason you need to segment these is that if you're looking for the word monk later, then you won't be able to find it unless we've cut it out of its surrounding context. Um, or the one below, entaf tren orpsha, he who made us keep the ceremony. And again, a relative marker, a past marker, and so on. Um, so the segmentation into these big blocks is actually done manually, even though the manuscripts are actually in Scriptio Continua, there, there are no spaces in the manuscripts per se. There are some diacritics, so this apostrophe-like thing that you see here sometimes corresponds to what we think of as uh, these complex word forms, but not always. So you sometimes get the diacritics corresponding to that. Uh, but it turns out that no researcher actually transcribes in Scriptio Continua. So no text that we've come across that anybody has produced did not have spaces, at least between the big word forms. So we haven't invested any efforts in doing that automatically. Uh, we do have an automatic morpheme segmentation um, script, which just goes and, and tries to break up these different colored blocks, basically. And um, the third major thing that we've done is work on part of speech tagging, which is um, trying to assign to these colorful units their part of speech category so that we can do some grammatical work on the texts. And we've done this by training a model for the freely available tree tagger by Helmut Schmidt, using a lexicon that we uh, received from the CMCL project, courtesy of Professor Tito Orlandi. And using this tagger, we developed um, uh, two different, actually two different taggers, two different um, part of speech tag sets to train on. One has 45 tags, and that's the fine-grained tag set, and it has all sorts of distinctions between proper nouns and common nouns, between different types of pronouns. And then there's a coarse-grained tag set, which just says, this is a noun, this is a verb, I don't know what kind of noun, but it's a noun. Um, and the inter-annotator agreement on the fine-grained tag set is around uh, 94%, or a cap of 93, which means that when two people tag the same text, they usually agree on what the correct part of speech tag is. So we're working on refining the guidelines, but um, 
it's, it's a fairly usable tag set. And the tagger does quite well with it, at least within the domain. So if you give it more Chanute to tag that it hasn't tagged before, um, then it does fine. It does in the mid-90s, mid-90% accuracy, which is fine. Um, if you let it tag out of the main text that it ha has never seen before and for which it doesn't have the vocabulary, then it does quite badly. So I tested it on some um, documentary papyri from papyri.info. This is uh, some con con contractual text. And uh, it does quite badly. And here's where you really get better results with the course tag set because it becomes unable to distinguish the fine classes. In, in the other uh, texts within the domain, there is not a huge improvement with the co course tag set. Okay, so that was a very brief introduction to uh, the types of annotation that we've been doing. We also have done some manual annotations like translation, which shouldn't surprise anyone. That's obviously interesting to do. Um, language of origin for some words. So if a word is of Greek or Latin origin, that might be interesting. Um, some coreference annotation that's basically um, so explicitly annotating when two phrases refer to the same entity in the real world. So in the top right image there, you see some rectangles colored in different colors. And the first one is Apa Papnuta, that's uh, St. Pafnutius. And the last one is Pullo, which stands for the old man. And the old man happens to be referring to St. Pafnutius, so they're colored the same color in this visualization. Uh, that's coreference annotation. We've only done that for the apothegmata. And some entity tagging of people and places and so on. Some parallel alignment with Greek, just sentence-wise alignment. That's also not very difficult, especially for Bible text. That's not very difficult to do, verse-wise. Um, and some very, very preliminary tests on syntactic annotation, which you see below, and which is not yet online, and also for a very small portion of the text at, at the present. OK, so now we have a lot of data. Um, the question is, how do you represent all this data? So we have texts that have very, very many annotations, like um, they have different views of the text. You have a diplomatic text. You have the normalized text at the same time. You have information about individual characters in the diplomatic text. So for instance, if they were a different color or size, so kind of rendering instructions in TI. Um, you have different segmentations. So the words are separated into these word chunks and at the same time into the smaller morphemes. So this is perhaps a more unique aspect of, of Coptic. Um, but I think everything else should be relevant for a lot of people working on, on manuscripts. And even different segmentations are relevant for people who work with line breaks within words, for instance, which is a common problem, I think, for a lot of projects. Um, so the question is, how can you search through all of this data, and how can you visualize it in a way that's usable? Well, the first problem that we ran into when using kind of corpus linguistics technology to process these things has been these segmentations, because in corpus linguistics software, typically things are based on the idea of words. So the smallest unit of analysis is usually referred to as a token in corpus linguistics, and it's usually the same thing as a word, and you get people giving examples of a search to be something like, give me all words preceding the word God. That's an easy question, right? You expect a search software to be able to do that, but what is a word? When is God a word? When was the word God, and what is the word before it? Or uh, give me the mentions of St. Paphnutius plus minus 10 words, right? Or give me gl the glosses father and son and find them within 20 words. And all these things rely on a very clearly defined concept of word. So the concept of word is complex in Coptic, and you have annotations that span parts of words. So if you use the smallest possible unit of annotation, you sometimes end up getting individual characters. So I've marked two cases here at the bottom right. Uh, one of them is just a character in red, and one of them is the first character in, in a word that continues on the next line. And the English translation is meant to loosely illustrate what's going on here. So the first red character is in the middle of the word said, and it's big and red. And the last letter in the first character is, um, well, the, the person is saying it's been eight years. And after the first letter of eight, then uh, the, the line just breaks. So if you were counting individual um, characters, then, um, well, plus minus 10 units, you probably didn't mean, mean for the 10th unit to just be that one character, right? You probably would have wanted the entire word. Okay, so um, we actually developed some solution to these problems that was not developed for Coptic at all in the software um, system ANIS, which was used for complex uh, linguistic corpora, and we actually developed a solution partly as a, an answer to what to do when dialogue data between multiple speakers in a spoken corpus overlaps. And it turns out that you can use the same solution for Coptic manuscript data, which is very fortuitous. And the idea is defining certain annotation layers as segmentations. And a segmentation is based basically an alternative view on issues of adjacency and proximity and context size. So if you define your word annotation 
uh, as a segmentation, it means that from now on you can tell the system, well, give me adjacency in words. Give me proximity in words. Give me context of plus minus 10 in words. But you could also change your mind about that and tell it to give me, okay, now give it to me in morphemes, and so on. Um, another issue that should be distinguished is that it's not just what you're searching for in terms of adjacency or proximity, but it's also what you want to see. So these things don't necessarily need to um, go together. So you could have a query that's looking for the next uh, normalized word, but you want it displayed in diplomatic characters. Right? So you want not the normalized view, but you want to search based on the position of normalized um, material. Um, to make it a little more concrete, this is what it looks like in our interface. There are two points where you can switch um, segmentations. You can change the base text you're looking, on, you're looking at. So you can decide, I want to see whole words now, and that will change what you're seeing. And you can say, I want the context of left context 5, right context 5, in units of word, right, or in units of uh, morpheme or something else. Um, and this is basically another example of the same. I guess some, some highlights are... Um, so this is a search for a person, and it's found a person named Abba Antonius. And Abba Antonius happens to be line broken after the un. So you see Abba, un, and then Tonius goes on in the next line at the top right. And um, if you're looking at whole words, well, Coptic words, for instance, contain both the preposition and the noun when there are prepositional phrases, similarly to Semitic languages. An orthographic word contains prepositions as well. So if you're looking for whole words, you'll actually get here in Abba Antonius, of Abba Antonius, or to Abba Antonius, and that's one word, because you've asked for complete words and there's no way to separate that. If you ask for uh, individual normalized units, then suddenly there's a space here. And if you just ask for the so-called tokens, for the minimal units, then you'll also get separations wherever there's uh, an annotation transition. So because of the line break, there's a space here in the middle of Antonius. And these are kind of reflexes of this architecture. You can also search for these things, so um, we use our query language, which is called AQL, Anis Query Language, which has the basic principle of defining some annotations that are being searched for, and then some relationships between them. So suppose you want to find verbs of Greek origin, then you look for the part of speech V, and it's called POS in our corpora, but you could name it whatever you want. Anis doesn't really care about names of annotations. Um, and you call for POS equals V, and you call for the source language to be Greek, but the question is, what is the relationship between do these two things? Are you looking for a verb followed by a Greek word, preceded by a Greek word, a verb that is at the same time a Greek word? And that's where the operators or uh, relationships come into play. And here it's telling us that number one has identical coverage to number two. Okay, so this underscore equal sign underscore stands for uh, identical coverage in Annis, meaning these two things happen at the same time. And that's a verb that also is a source language Greek. And then you get some results, uh, so repent and have faith. And if you know Coptic, or even if you know Greek, actually, you'll notice that there's some stuff before the Greek word. So the first one is afmetanoi, he repented, and that includes some Coptic conjugation stuff before the Greek word. And this is because we're looking at words in the Coptic stream, right? If we were to look at uh, normalized morphemes, we'd only get the Greek verb because it's been separated at another segmentation level. Um, and you can also make reference to your segmentations in searches. So there are a lot of operators, for instance, adjacency, inclusion. So one thing is within, contained within another thing, or overlaps another thing, or left aligned means two things start at the same point, right aligned would mean they end at the same point. And then some um, kind of graph-based operators, like something dominates something else in a graph, or um, pointing relations, or things like the coreference annotation I mentioned. So uh, the old man might point back to St. Paphnutius. And it's possible to incorporate segmentations into the query, so um, you can have one is followed by two, or you could say that two is the next word after one. There could be other things in the middle that are not considered words, perhaps some sort of um, uh, decorations made by the scribe which are annotated, but if they're not words, that does not uh, constitute one is followed, is the next word, uh, two is the next word after one. And the same within one to ten uh, norm normalized units, okay, so you can just make any sort of segmentation be the basis of your query. Finally, for um, the query language, you can also look for metadata. So um, this is done by prefixing your annotation name with meta and two colons. And the only difference between the meta annotations and the normal annotations is that they're not referred back to as number one and number two because they don't have any relationships. They're just kind of uh, criteria to rule certain results out. So here, if the manuscript name doesn't begin with monb, then I don't want to see the result. Okay, and this is a regular expression. That's why there's a slash and star. Um, and it just searches for results from a certain set of manuscripts, uh, particularly from the White Monastery. Uh, and you can also use negation and so on. 
So if you're interested in the query language and the software, you can also have a look at the NS webpage. It describes this in great detail. Um, but since time is short, I'd like to move on to um, saying a few words about the architecture of the system and how formats are handled in it. So um, it might not surprise you to hear that not all of the things that I've described here can be done with one format. Specifically, some of them are very um, suitable for TI encoding. So things like manuscript structure or metadata, things like character rendering are great in TI. Other things are less great, so TI is not very compatible with um, automated part of speech taggers. They usually prefer other more, more simple kind of one word per line formats or something like that. Or parsing or coreference annotation. There are dedicated linguistic formats and annotation tools that are good at doing these annotations and they have different formats. And the way of dealing with this, which we've done for a lot of corpora even before I ever started working on Coptic corpora, is using an open source software called Salt and Pepper, which can convert multiple formats into each other. And the basic principle is um, there's a meta model called Salt, which uh, should not be confused with a format. It's not some sort of format in any sense. It's just a, a real-time, non-persistent, in-memory model in Java. So it's an object model. And there are converter modules which import and export data into and, and out of the model. So um, we support a lot of formats with um, salt and pepper. And one of the formats, for instance, is the tree tagger format. So if you part of speech tag your data with tree tagger, you can import that into salt. And the same applies to a lot of other formats. Um, and finally, we export the data. Well, in this case, the most relevant export direction is to rel anis, the, in the uh, table dump format of the anis database but um, you could also convert into other formats. And ANIS also uses SALT as its inter internal representation model while it's running. A big working package for the project I will be working on um, in this year and also in the coming year, and about which I'll tell you briefly at the end of this talk, um, will be introducing TIXML into this circle of formats and getting better support for inter interactivity or interoperability between TIXML and uh, tools for natural language processing. Okay, so I now move on to the second part of the talk about visualizing data. Um, an interesting uh, thing we realized when we started working with corpora that have very many annotations is that you can't look at it all at once. So you can have a corpus that allows you to answer questions like, um, I want to know about people who are indirect objects of the verb show, who are aligned with Greek things that are neuters, and so on. And you can really ask about all these different things by kind of combining your annotations but you can't look at everything at once. So this is, for instance, a salt graph of two words from one of our corpora, and the two words are the red node and the purple node, and there's no way you're going to be able to read that because there are way too many annotations and, and the human eye is just not made for that. So one of the things that we realize is that you need to break it down. You need to partition your data into multiple sensible visualizations that are kind of thematically grouped. Um, and there are two conflicting requirements when you do this. On the one hand, you want to have a perfect visualization. If you're doing syntax, you want a syntax tree that looks like you're used to drawing it on a blackboard, um, and so on. But if you build visualizations for every single type of data, you spend a lot of time building these, and they end up being not reusable next month. So what you'd ideally want to do is stay generic, to have a minimal amount of visualizations that kind of catch everything. And this is a big challenge. So um, a question that we've dealt with and, and um, that is actually quite interesting is how do you avoid programming new visualizations whenever you add an annotation there? Kind of classifying things as, okay, this is a special case of something we've seen before. Um, for some purposes, essentially you can't avoid programming dedicated visualizations because you'll be unhappy. It won't do what you wanted it to do. You wanted it to look different and you'll have to write something special. Um, the two major classes of cases that I've come across when you have to do this is when you either have some very special interactive functionality, so you need a visualization that talks back to the user when they do this and that. And another one is if you have very special layouting algorithms. So you cannot teach very generic pieces of software to lay out data in very specific ways. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. But for other purposes, it turns out you can re reuse visualizations much more than you might think. Um, by using kind of configurable style sheets. And um, another thing that you need to do while you're doing this, especially for cor corpora that um, are like manuscript data and similar things, is to take these segmentations into account. So what are you thinking of when you mean my text? I want to visualize the text. So here are some typical dedicated examples. There are others on the NS webpage that we've not used for Coptic. Um, syntax trees is perhaps a, a very uh, trivial example because you need to lay out these Independency trees, you need to lay out these arches, make them tall enough, make the labels not cover each other ideally. 
Uh, it becomes even worse if you do constituent syntax trees and not dependency syntax trees. And um, an example of interactivity is perhaps this reference view where if you click on some um, discourse referent in the text, it will light up the other ones and give you some information about annotations of that um, co-reference. So there's, there are actually also annotations on the edges between these nodes. So the type of co-reference is also being annotated. Say, um, if somebody is being referred to as the same exact phrase, for instance, the old man and then again the old man, that receives a special annotation, but if they're being referred to pronominally, that receives a different annotation and so on. And all of these things need to be viewed and uh, be, be clickable and so on. Um, and here's an example about why you need to take the segmentations into account. Well, for instance, things like um, syntax trees would work very badly if you let them work on the minimal units because syntax trees work well with what in, in European languages are considered to be words. In Coptic, it's not exactly the words because the articles and prepositions are written together with the following morphemes. So first of all, you need to break that down, but at the same time, you also need to merge things. So if a morpheme happens to be broken in the middle because of a line break, you need to re-merge that for the syntax tree. So the syntax tree visualization in Anis, for instance, because of this project and also for some other projects, needed to be made aware of um, segmentations. So you can tell it what is the basic unit for the leaves of my tree. And uh, this is an example with the band of bandits. So if you're looking at the token-wise representation on the left, it says band of ban and dits. Um, the colors I should mention are the result of an Anis search. So if you look for number one has a relationship to number two and so on, in your result you'll see that number one is red and number two is purple and, and other colors. Um, looking at the same thing in the kind of diplomatic manuscript view of the same text on the far right, you'll see that um, the reason for the space here on the left is that the text actually is broken up as follows. Band of ban, and of ban is because the preposition belongs together with a noun. And then dits, and dits is separate because it's on a separate line. And found them together drinking. This is just how Coptic words kind of bunch up together. Um, but the syntax tree doesn't want to care about all that. It wants the n to be separated because it's a preposition and it wants the bandits to be together because they're a noun. Right? So you need to tell it, well, look at this for your words. What you think of as words are contained in the following annotation level. Um, this is all not to say that you can never reuse these dedicated visualizers. For instance, we found a rather creative use for the uh, coreference visualizer in doing parallel alignment visualization. So we figured out at some point that coreference is actually rather similar to parallel alignment. You want things to light up together that are connected. And then we just duplicated the coreference visualizer and put it side by side. So this is the apophthegmata patrum in Greek and Coptic. And if you click on a sentence, it just lights up the parallel sentence in the same color in the parallel text. So that's actually one case where it surprisingly worked out. Um, more often, though, you'd want to use some more flavorless generic visualizations. And the one that we use by far the most often is this grid view that you see here at the top right. A grid annotation basically gives you where annotations start and end. It just marks boundaries and tells you how they overlap. So here you see a lot of TI style annotations, or ones that actually come also in the TI version of our corpora, uh, like column breaks and page breaks and line breaks and the line number and so on. And they're just spans that start and end at certain points, so they're all um, visualizable at the same time. It's good for flat information that does need to be layouted in, in any spe special way. Um, at the same time, we have a more complex generic visualizer, and it's got a big question mark as its um, picture because it can look like anything you want. And I'll explain in a moment how it works and, and show some examples of how it looks. Essentially, it's using a style sheet to style your annotation in a very dynamic way. That's not unlike XSLT for XML documents. As for the grid, one thing that I will say about it is that it turns out it's not possible to look at all the annotations in the world at the same time. So again, there's a, a certain overload starting with a certain amount of annotations and it becomes sensible to group them into thematic groups. So here you see a separate grid being opened for the entity annotation of some animal, um, and other annotations like the parts of speech are in a grid above that, in a separate grid. And in Anis, you can kind of open and close these annotation layers separately. So if you'd click on the plus here, you'd get the coreference view that I showed earlier. Um, now as for the HTML visualizer, um, I wanted to show some very detailed and concrete examples of what it looks like and how it's actually programmed because it's meant to, on the one hand, illustrate what's actually happening in the background, so it's not as abstract. And at the same time, it's relatively easy to learn, so it's not as complicated as you might think. This is the code for our normalized um, view of documents. 
and it consists of two files, a configuration file and a CSS file. So if you know CSS, cascading style sheets, that's a basic HTML technology that's used all over the web to style um, uh, browser output. And on the left, you see four instructions. The first instruction tells you that if you see an annotation called P, generate an HTML element called P, and that produces paragraphs. It's as simple as that. Whenever you see a P, an P annotation, surround that block of text with a paragraph. The second one says, um, if you have a word annotation, make an HTML span element and give it the style word. And we'll see what that is in a moment. The same thing happens to norm units. These are the normalized units because we have a normalized view here. But there's something added. We also put the value of the normalized thing. So there's a third column saying, and into the span of the style norm, please put the value of the annotation norm. And that's the first time at which, at which that's the first point in this particular visualizer where text was written out into the browser, the contents of the norm annotation. And finally, there's a trans annotation, which is the translation, and it produces a T element with a, a title attribute. So after the colon, that means that this will be an attribute of that HTML element, and its value is said to be the value of the annotation trans. Okay, that's it. That's the entire HTML code for the visualization. At the same time, there's a CSS style sheet styling it. So there's the div.html viz. That's basically the container window for the entire visualization. It's being given a certain width and a certain font. That's not so interesting. The interesting part are the two instructions at the bottom, where the translation uh, style is said to be red whenever somebody hovers on it. OK, nothing more. And uh, the word style, which adds a space after it. So after the word style, put in a space. That's it. The result is this. Uh, which is surprisingly usable for how little code went into this. If you think about it, you want to write a new visualization for normalized corpora, this is all you had to do. Um, and how it works is, um, well, you see the generated HTML code for a certain part of the text on the right, the part highlighted in red, or part of it. And you see that the paragraphs are produced indeed by a P element. Okay. That just wraps the entire um, paragraph. Then you see this T element with the class translation, which gets the translation style and therefore turns red when hovered on. And it has a title attribute. Now, in, in most browsers, the title attribute gets rendered as this kind of tooltip, which is where you see this translation about Abraham, our father, wishing to have children with Sarah. And that's how you get the translation. And then there's the interplay between words and norms. So the word units actually don't do anything. They just group together norms. If you look at um, these bottom two here, for instance, these are pen iot, that's our father. So one morpheme normalizes pen our, and one of them is father, and together they form a word. So what is the word doing? Well, you'll recall that the word thing gets a space implanted after, after it, right? So that's what causes the normalized things to stick together and get spaces between them. Again, that's it. That's the code for this visualizer. Um, now, as for reusability, I'd like to show you a different example, this one, which looks more or less like a print edition. This is the diplomatic view of the very same data. It's not a different corpus, it's the same corpus, and the annotations are all coming, you can imagine in your mind's eye that these annotations are coming from this grid, okay? So these are the norms I mentioned, these are the word spans that I mentioned, and these are the dipple spans. The dipple will be important in a moment, that's a diplomatic transcription. Um, Oh, so actually, no, this is based on tokens by mistake. This visualization is not based on the DIPL. It's based on these talks here, the minimal units. And the reason why you need minimal units and not the diplomatic units is because things may happen within a diplomatic unit, such as line breaks, or such as letters being read in big, and so on. So what this visualization does is it takes all the tokens, the, mid, the very minimal units, the tiniest units, and it just writes them out in spans. Okay, token, 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 token. It puts the value of each token in front of each other, just like that. Then it surrounds any LB annotations, so the line breaks with a div, so an HTML division, a kind of container, and gives us the style line. And then it does um, something for the page breaks and column breaks. For the page breaks, it creates, first of all, a table with a certain title. And um, then it creates a row. Okay, and these are pages. Page breaks happen, happen every page, and every page is a table. Why is every page a table? Well, because the pages contain two columns. So what we've done is we've put the two columns into table cells, which in HTML are called TDs. Okay, so we've just placed two columns next to each other as cells in this one page table. And finally, there's the annotation called high rend, which is the TI element high and its attribute rend for rendering. And that just gets the value of the rendering instruction. Okay, again, that's it. And you get the thing on the right. So how does that work? 
Well, it works thanks to the CSS style sheet. It's a little bit more complex, but it's still not immensely much. There's not much more in it than what I show here for space reasons. Um, there are two instructions about what to do with lines. The first one tells it to make the lines 22 pixels high and to display, to display them as a block, which is what makes them kind of stack on top of each other and be exactly the same height. Um, then there's the instruction about nth of type 5n. Uh, this is a more obscure CSS command that tells it to do something every five elements of line. And the thing that it does every five elements of line is print a counter of line count. So it's just counting the lines and printing the number every five lines. Okay, that's that done with one line of CSS, basically. And that's where you get the line numbers from. Um, and then there are instructions about what to do with the pages and the columns. Well, the PBs, the pages, they just get a border. That's where you get the box around the page. And the columns get, first of all, they re reset to the line count so that it starts numbering the lines again in the second column. And they also have a fixed width. Okay, that's it. Finally, the rendering instructions are the things that make the nice red and big characters and so on. They basically use what's called CSS selectors. They look for certain words within the value of the rent annotation. And if it contains the word superscript somewhere, that's what the star is for. Star means contain somewhere. Uh, if it contains a superscript, then make the font 80% big and align super. If it contains the word red, then make the color red and so on. And if you were to want to integrate a new corpus next week that has the color beige, you'll just put you know, an instruction what to do when it's beige, or if it's some other sort of formatting. So it's very, very easy to adapt this to new visual attributes of manuscripts. And that's what's so attractive about this generic approach. Okay? So what this gives you is, is kind of a um, catch-all solution to visualizing things like TI rent attributes. As a final point I'd like to address very briefly because we don't really have time, um, and perhaps for the discussion is also an interesting topic, is what to do with aggregate visualizations. So one form of visualization that's very interesting is taking a lot of data and making some big visualization with it rather than looking at one particular position. Well, in the latest version of ANIS, we have some basic frequency analysis, just kind of a histogram. But here too, we've tried to look at generic things and how to make this more extensible for the future. And what makes this visualization special is that it um, utilizes the Anis query language that we saw earlier. So what it can do is it can give you a frequency breakdown of all the combinations of element number one that you search for and element number two. So this, for instance, is a query for entities containing parts of speech, and it gives you a breakdown of the part of speech by entity. So you can see that in 38 cases in this apothegmata corpus, a person was coded by a noun, but uh, further down the line, in the highlighted part, the person was represented by a proper noun. So in 12 cases, you have a proper noun. These are the Pafnudius cases. These are the old man kind of cases, or the monk or something like that, so a non-proper noun. And this is not um, tailor-made because you can just, pu just put another question to the system, formulate another query, and give, it a, give a breakdown of the combinations of, of the results of those elements that you search for. Now, it's an open question, and one that I'd like to take into discussion, how much uh, more we should build in terms of aggregate visualizations, because there are very good um, kind of generic tools that already do this on export data. So here are some word clouds, for instance, for the apothegmata versus the Gospel of Mark. And they were not done with our software. They were done in R. So we work a lot with R. There's good packages for doing this. Why would you want to rewrite that? And essentially, it's, it's a losing battle, because you'll keep reproducing visualizations, and these are being supported by other people, not wasting your resources. So it's um, kind of an interesting tension because users sometimes come to our group and ask for extensions to our software, and then we really have to think, do we want to write this ourselves, or do we want to tell them to use something else? Uh, but it can be quite instructive. So this example, for instance, even if you don't know Coptic, you might be able to notice that, you know, this, if you don't know Coptic and you do know Greek, you'll notice that you can't understand what's going on the left, but you understand what's going on the right, because the right is Greek. So the, the gospel is full of Greek words, um, and the, the Coptic one, I mean, what are these words? Well, they're things that concern ascetics in, in the desert, like eating and wine and old people and titles and me and you. So me and you because there's a lot of dialogue, a lot more dialogue, or substantially more dialogue. And this is the kind of vocabulary you get, you get in a gospel, like um, baptism and impure and gospel and Holy Ghost and Jesus and, and John and so on. Okay, so I'll finish up by saying, um, I hope one lesson to take from this lecture is that annotation projects in, in this day and age should not be limited by the corpus architecture. You should think what you want to annotate and you should just dare to do that because you'll get unexpected synergies. You'll get uh, things that 
interoperate and you'll discover that you can formulate really complex queries and, and visualize really interesting things. Um, now, a lot of people have already been doing this, but they've been doing it in a separate spreadsheet on their computer. So what you might do is you maybe, even if you have a digital resource, you'll search for certain positions in the text and then make your own notes and say, okay, this one was a case of this category, but you won't put it back into the corpus. And I'd like to argue that it's very important to put these things back into the corpus, um, first of all, because other people will profit from them. And um, second of all, because you'll be able to use all of these computational resources then. So let's say you wanted uh, these word clouds, but only for verbs. Well, if you annotated what are verbs, then you'll be able to do that. Or you want to do something with place names and, and highlight them and link them to other resources. Well, you could do that if you use an entity tagger. And you can train an entity tagger if you put your annotations in a processable format. Um, and many, many other um, applications. Um, and also because maybe the most important reason, because these things can interoperate. So let's say you're interested in the, you're interested in the typical uh, objects of certain verbs in some constructions. Well, you could look into that, but if you also have your Greek and native, uh, Greek and native vocabulary annotation, you can break that down into which are the, the Greek cases and which are the native ones. What are the differences between them? Um, say that's not enough for you. You also are interested in, in the different ways they were translated in each case. Okay, just add the translations as part of your search and so on. So once you start putting all of your analyses back into the corpus, new possibilities open up. That's what I'm trying to argue for. And finally, um, I hope you've uh, been able to see that it's not unrealistic to expect good visualization facilities, but you need to put a lot of thought into um, what is the right visualization for your data? Is it possible to reuse something that already exists? And how do I prevent my software that I've worked hard on being relevant only for this one project? So it's very good to do things that are generic, that other people can profit from, and in the end you gain resources because other people will use it, will develop it further, and you'll be able to use it again. So um, really for many purposes, working open source using generic technologies is the best solution. Um, last word about where we're going from here. I'm um, starting a um, young researcher group funded by the BMBF at uh, Humboldt University this March. We'll be working a lot more on this COPIC data, at least for the pilot phase, which has already be been funded for 2014. And we plan to expand that to other languages in the ancient world with similar problems because, well, I personally believe that there is a lot of um, work that can be done with technologies that already exist today if people only knew how to make the adaptation. And um, this is the main goal of this research group to offer access to natural language processing tools, to computation linguistics tools for ancient world resources. And uh, the first point we're going to tackle is how to deal with TI resources directly using these resources. So making TI more interoperable with um, corpus linguistics tools. And incidentally, we're looking for a student assistant right now. So if you know a student who um, has some uh, basic programming skills, wants to learn more and is interested in, in these ancient texts, we're looking somebody for somebody uh, for 60 hours a month at the moment. So That'd be great, just um, uh, send them to us, to the web page, and um, have them send in their resume. Otherwise, well, stay tuned for more. We're just getting started. And with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you.